you for making the time. This is the last of the four classes that we're having. In this case, um, I need to be two people. I need to be the leader and the reader. So I'm going to start us off. And this is a prayer taken from a prayer service on the 17th Catholic Social Teaching. So let us begin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us place ourselves in the presence of God, who calls us to be salt and light. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, and verses 14 through 16. You, you are the light of all the light. Um, Hello. I know this, but thank you, may just be. So let us begin. Um, a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, <coughs> 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The church, the church of the teaching is the greatest treasure of wisdom about building a just society and live lives of holiness in the challenges of our society. Option for and with the poor and vulnerable. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 45. I made a mistake. <laughs> um, so let's find what the reading is. Does anybody have a Bible? Yes, perfect. And we read, they devoted themselves to the te they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Speak to God. So we read. A basic, a basic moral, moral test, test is this how our most vulnerable members are there. And society are different divisions between rich and poor. Are they together in the dignity of work and the right of workers? Presence. A reading from the book of Sirach, Sirach chapter 34, verse 22. Presents from the lawless do not win God's favor. The economy must serve people. Work is more than a way to make a living. It is a form of continuing participation. Global solidarity. 
solidarity. A reading from the prophet Micah. Micah chapter four, chapter four, verse three. He shall judge between many peoples and set terms for strong and distant nations. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not rise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. We are brothers and sisters keepers. We are one human family. Whatever our nation does, we will rise to ethnic and economic and ideological Care for God's creation. A reading from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God looked at everything he had made and found it very good. Evening came, came and morning followed, the sixth day. We show our respect for the Creator by our stewardship of creation. We are called to protect people in the planet. We are in relationship with all of God's creation. This environmental challenge is a fundamental moral and ethical dimension that cannot be ignored. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to continue talking about the seven themes of Catholic social teaching. Last time we talked about the first three, and so tonight we're going to be talking about the remaining four. Uh, I would like you to take a look at this a picture on the screen. Check. So we see, what do we see on the screen? Anybody, any good volunteer? There's a woman on the screen, right? I'm painting. Yes, that. Pregnant woman. Baby in Europe. It's there's a baby. So we see a mother, and also we see a baby um, in the mother's tummy, right? Uh, if we look closely at the image, we also see something else about the woman. She's the earth. She is here. Uh, this is a painting, a drawing that was put together by a young woman from India. Uh, you may have learned that for several months, our church worldwide has been promoting a film uh, where four different strangers came together to talk about the needs of people uh, on the margins. Uh, they were invited by a Pope, uh, Pope Francis, to come to the Vatican and to engage in a discussion and to collaborate with him on possible solutions. So this is a drawing that a young woman from India uh, drew and she gifted it to Pope Francis. The first thing we're gonna do tonight is we're going to review the last class because it's very important that we remember what we have done up to this point and where we're going. So we're going to repeat some of what we said last time, but it's just to make sure that we understand the fundamental uh, elements of that social teaching. Second, we're going to talk a little bit more about the specific themes, the four remaining themes, which are option four, and with the poor and vulnerable, dignity of work and the rights of workers, global solidarity, care for creation. In the process, we're going to talk about how to travel the longest distance in the world. I'm sure that many of you have been all over the world. I haven't, but I think that some of you also understand that it's not a physical distance out there in the world, but it's a distance that exists between us, or not only between us, but in our own bodies. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's review some of the key concepts. And this is very important for us. We talked about this last time. And the point for us doing this again is to really understand the components of Catholic social teaching. Very basic definition, Catholic social teaching is a set of social teachings 
that the Catholic Church calls the faithful to practice. So think about uh, a sport, any sport that comes to mind, let's say basketball. There's some guidelines that uh, whoever wants to practice that sport uh, is called to follow, not only to enjoy the sport, but also to compete. And the idea behind the rules is to facilitate the entertainment and also um, some sort of safe competition. In this case, Catholic Social Teaching guides us into action to care for the people in our world out of love for God. <clears throat> so the uh, components of uh, Catholic Social Teaching are three. Sacred Scripture, we spoke about the book of Genesis, we also spoke about the prophets, and we have been talking a little bit more about the New Testament and the parables of Jesus. Second, where do we get those teachings from? Typically, we get them from the papal encyclicals. And there's also two other documents that the Church has put together, which are the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the Compendium of the Catholic Social Doctrine of the Church. And lastly, how do we engage in Catholic social teaching? It's mostly through church tradition, which for many of us, we come first hand um, in the presence of liturgy and understanding how the biblical readings urge us to love other people and to love God. Uh, also, we said the signs of the times, which is how we understand that God is talking to us now. What is the message that God is giving us? And lastly, we spoke about the theological model of see, judge, act. And that is a very simple model that we are called to practice, to evaluate what's going on around us, how God is asking us to act, and the decisions and choices that we have to make. And we spoke a little bit about Adam and Eve in regards to that, and also about the Good Samaritan, and how we see what Jesus is teaching us in, those, um, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. We spoke about life and dignity of the human person, which is the central, the first theme of Catholic social teaching. Life and dignity of the human person are sort of like the foundation of the remaining six elements. So if you think of Catholic social teaching as being a building, you can think of theme one as being the foundation, and then the remaining elements as being the walls, the windows, um, anything that makes up the structure of the building. We went over this uh, image, this graphic of the tree, how the different themes are like a branch of a tree, but all of them are interconnected. So there's this collection of themes that help us understand God's love for ourselves and for the world. We spoke about life and dignity. Um, the awareness that God is the giver and source and purpose of all life and that we are called to love, to respect, love, and foster life. And the aspect of dignity is this um, self, worth, and value that anybody and everybody has because it has been given to us by God. We also went over this uh, image, how the different elements of belonging, justice, and dignity come together and gives us an understanding of what Catholic social teaching is talking about. On the one hand, we talk about fraternity, charity, and social justice, and we talk about the common good. The five social institutions of society. This is important because it tells us that there's five different ways in which um, society is organized. So us, being agents of social change, are called to engage with each of these institutions. Normally, all of us do with the family because that's where we're raised and where we learn our values. But then we have the other non-familiar institutions, which are government, education, economy, and religion. Okay, so let's go into the themes. The longest distance in the world I came to understand the longest distance in the world from a priest from Notre Dame, uh, Father Daniel Grudy. He works with migrants in the water. And he 
taught us that the longest distance in the world is really the distance between our hearts, our hearts, I'm sorry, and our minds. Many times we understand concepts and we understand things analytically. And that's half of the story. The other half is that we have to respond with a compassionate heart to whatever is going on. So we have to do analysis, which is where the brain comes in, but we have to connect that analysis with some sort of charitable or compassionate informed response. So for us, we have the call by Pope John Paul II to engage in a new kind of evangelization. And what he means by that is that our faith has to be centered on this ongoing conversion to Christ. For a long period of time, we understood evangelization as something that happens to other people. Something that we have to do to engage with the world. That the world has to be evangelized. And that's part of what uh, John Paul II is asking us to do. But he's also asking us to enter into this ongoing personal conversion. So it's not only just an external action that we do to others, but it's an internal process that we engage in. So he's asking us to think about this change to our hearts and to our minds. Faith involves a profound change of mind and heart. And that goes towards this understanding of how do we overcome many of the challenges that we have. If we have the ability to analyze social problems, and our goal is to turn people towards Christ, then our mission is really to engage lovingly with other people. So the idea here is not so much to uh, preach, but to reflect God's love. And that is by showing concretely through acts of love what are the actions that we're doing. Let me give you an example. So, we, as I think in one of the early classes, we talked about the example of St. Francis. And we have to try to remember St. Francis just because um, he is somebody so close to us, somebody whose life we um, try to uh, celebrate, right? We have a banner of St. Francis at the back of the room, and we are a Franciscan parish. So, for St. Francis, we understand his journey of faith as not only being one that happened once, right? Francis felt called to do something different than what the other faith communities or religious communities were doing. And God entered into this encounter with Francis through different instances. The most memorable of that is the encounter with the leper. And I believe uh, uh, Chuck, is it Chuck? Helped us remember Francis' dream, rebuild my church. That was the uh, message that Francis got. But in as much as Francis began doing external things, rebuilding churches, feeding the poor, um, finding himself in the company of other people who wanted to serve God, there was an internal transformation happening in Francis. So these external acts that people could see were driven by this very personal change internally. And that's what we read here. So let's read together. The Christian faith is a all conversion to Jesus Christ. It is the fruit of God's grace and the free response to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It arises from the depths of the human person and involves such a profound transformation of heart and mind that it causes the believer to change radically both internally and externally. The Blessed Virgin Mary's perfect response to the grace of the Holy Spirit represents a memorial conversion to Christ and the purest realization of faith. 
What this thing means is helping us understand is what I just tried to describe about Francis. Francis began, St. Francis began doing some acts of mercy. Uh, have reminded us about Job and how Job uh, was able to. I, I was telling you how it was Job was able to question that and seek answers from that. And in the same way, we believe that Francis, St. Francis, did the same. He began this process, and along the way, I'm sure that there were a lot of questions, and we see. Um, in his documents, in the record of the documents that we have from St. Francis, um, an, an evolution of his thought. So, the National Directory for Catechesis, where the document where this is taken from, also gives us an example of Mary, uh, our uh, a model also. And we can also look to Mary for this ongoing internal and external change and transformation. So what do we know about the story of Mary? We know that she was engaged to be married uh, with St. Joseph, and then she gets a revelation and a visitation from the angel. Correct? The angel gave her. Thank you. And so she was given a choice. Mary was given a choice to make at that moment. Does she accept God's plan or does she do something else? And in our faith, we believe that Mary said yes. And we call that the fiat. This total surrender and trust in God. That is our hope also as believers that through these ongoing yeses that we have to God's plan, the fullness of his grace, which is saying in here, God's grace, this freely given great gift from God, will help us listen to the Holy Spirit, and then our lives will be transformed. So the equation is God's grace, the Spirit, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit talking to us and us responding to both of those, to the grace from God and to uh, the leading voice of the Spirit uh, in our daily life. This is another reminder that we talked about last class. Uh, very simple reminder, and, and it's part of the exercise that we're trying to accomplish here. So, the idea of a friend reaching out to you is more than a physical act. It's an emotional uh, process, right? So when we reach out to somebody, it's not just the physicality of trying to do something for someone else, but the intentions of goodwill behind that. So let's remember that as part of the uh, ongoing conversion process. Okay. So once we understand that there is this challenge of overcoming this distance between what we think and what we need to do lovingly. So we have those two things. I understand or I think that I understand something, but then I'm also called to answer to God's love for others. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a few biblical readings. This is a very common, uh, commonly known passage of the scripture, the first widow uh, contribution. And all of us are familiar with this passage from the scripture, right? And, and the, the reading says, when Jesus looked up, he saw some wealthy people putting their offerings into the treasury. And he noticed a poor widow putting into small coins. He said, I tell you truly, this poor widow put in more than all the rest. For those others have made offerings from their circle as well, but she from her poverty has offered her whole livelihood. One of the things that, one of the lessons that we learn from the scripture, and you're going to use the handout, uh, the first, the second handout now. So I would like you to take a look at the handout that has Psalm 34, verses 2 to 7. 
So last time I asked you to grab up armor. So this time I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Just reach the person that right next to you. And if you can, read whoever you decide, whoever you choose from the two of you to go first. Read it to the other person, and then the other person can read it back to you. And listen carefully to the, to the other person telling you or reading this to you. So let's read in groups, Psalm 34 to 7. And one of the very first things that happens 
is that they decide to choose seven men full of the spirit and of wisdom for the ministry of caring for the poor. The Arius community realized that being a disciple of Jesus meant demonstrating fraternity and solidarity in obedience to the Master's proclamation that the poor are blessed and heirs of the kingdom of heaven. While preparing for this class, I learned, and I didn't know this, that um, we began celebrating or acknowledging uh, World Day of the Poor back in 2017. I didn't know that. I genuinely didn't know that we have a day to acknowledge and to uplift the poor um, in the world. And this is taken from the first celebration by Pope Francis of the World Day of the Poor. Now let's go to the back of it because now we can read what the Acts of the Apostles said. So, again, I need you to reach out to your partner and read Acts 6, verses 1 through 3. And we all do, we also learn to administer 
our treasure, right? Whether, whether our treasure is time or money or some other treasure that we have. So yes, you have to find a balance between serving and understanding how to administer that service. I think there was a hand. Mr. Domingo, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Yes. We were talking about the Hellenists who are the Gentiles and the Hebrews who are the Jews. And it seems like the group that are Jews, are not, I'm not sure, but they're neglecting the widows of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are the ones who are complaining. And so you're saying, you know, um, you know, you have to serve them Right, um, we see this happening in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, there is this um, lack of photo, of total understanding of how do we serve other another group who has a different background than us, and, and we see that a lot in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, there's also a section of the Acts of the Apostles where, uh, I think we read it last week, where uh, the apostles themselves have to send someone to instruct the people because there's some debate as to whether what foods people can eat or they cannot eat, right? And part of the answer that is given is that everything comes from God. And eventually we, we, I believe here in the book of Hebrews, in the letter to Hebrews, that there is no longer any Jew or Gentile, right? That that separation that existed in ideology is taken away by God's love. But you're right um, in pointing out that there is, there are two groups, and these two groups are trying to figure out what is the other group not doing well, and what can we do better? So, Let's just finish up with um, Matthew 5, and it's just one verse, and it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. So the emphasis for us is on trying to understand what do we do with the poor? What do we do with the poor as a church? If we go back to the, uh, to the Psalms, uh, the Psalms is saying that the poor person Whoever this poor person was, reached out to God in prayer and supplication. He acknowledged himself or herself as being poor. And they cried out to God. And God heard them. And God got involved in this person's life. So the Old Testament gives us this awareness that God listens to the poor. That is clear in the book of Psalms. He heard the cry of the poor. If we go to the Acts of the Apostles, we see a similar situation, but in this case it's the Christian community who listens to the cry of the poor. There is some tension happening between the Hellenists, the Hellenists and the Hebrews, and somebody is being neglected. So, in the first instance in the Old Testament, it was God who heard and who acted. In the Acts of the Apostles, we are getting this other option of the community itself responding to a need, to something that is being neglected. Now, if we look at the verse um, from Matthew, we have another layer to what being poor is. It says, poor in spirit. And if you look at the, uh, take a moment to look at the explanation that the uh, commentators are giving us at the bottom. Just take a moment to read that because it's very important. It says, the poor in spirit in the Old Testament, the poor are those who are without material possessions and whose confidence is in God. Do we see that in the uh, excerpt from the book of Psalms that we read? Whose total confidence is in God. We read that, right? The, the reading that we had showed us that. 
that the person who was crying out to God and trusted that God was going to respond. Matthew added the phrase in spirit in order to either indicate that only the devout poor were meant or to extend the beatitude to all, regardless of social rank, who recognize their complete dependence on God. So, when we look again to Francis, to St. Francis, in the guidelines that he set for the community of Franciscans, um, and Father Sam will help us understand this probably on a, on, a, on a later time. We see an emphasis on poverty, correct? We understand that Francis felt called to a, a deep poverty. And this is very close to the poverty that is described in Matthew. The poverty of the spirit or the kind of poverty that Francis tried to embrace was this freedom from attachments, freedom from anything that could pull him away from the love of God. And that is important for us also, because as we acknowledge that there's poor people or that some of us are poor in the world, we also have to trust that what we have doesn't hold us back from loving God and from loving others. So let's repeat that again. So as we understand that there are poor people in the world or that we ourselves could be poor people, we have to remember that whatever we have doesn't hold us back from loving God and from loving others. And that goes to the heart of being poor in spirit, where our total dependence is on God. Now, thinking about that, we're going to answer two questions. So the first question that we have is the following. How do the comments made by Pope Francis, the bottom of the page, the Statement at the bottom of page one. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. That's uh, those lines. How do those comments help us understand the model we talked about already? See, judge, and act. So let's think about this. Carefully. So, Pope Francis is reminding us that God is listening to the poor and that the Christian community serves the poor and is called to serve the poor. So, if the Christian community has this love for God and he has this love for our neighbors, then, how do we apply the model see, judge, and act to the issue of poverty? That's the question. How do we, how do we, how do all of us, how can we react or respond, respond to the issue of poverty using the model see, judge, and act? We begin by seeing, correct? So what do we see, how do we see people experiencing poverty? Anybody? Homelessness. Homelessness, correct. I missed to show you this sculpture. I also was not familiar with this sculpture at all. It's a homeless Jesus. Uh, there are several replicas of this artwork in different churches and also in the Vatican. So that goes to that gem, homelessness. We see not only the homeless, but we are called to see Jesus in the homeless, right? Which is 
taking another step. Yes, I see the homeless and I acknowledge the homeless. Now I can acknowledge Jesus in the homeless, either because Jesus is listening to them and he cares for them. That's one, one way to look at it. Or the second, because as a church, we are called to serve the poor. So we see uh, poverty in homelessness. Where else do we see poverty in our world? In our, how do we see poverty around us? Anybody? Thank you, Chad. Thank you. So now we get into more nuances. So we can think of two different ends, right? People who have things and people who don't have things. But there's also a middle where, where we can find people who have the bare minimum and who don't have. Um, dignified life. So they were important. I was reading an article over the weekend uh, from the New York Times. And what the article was saying is that many of us uh, unknowingly are being exploited. And, and that's a very hard word to use. And the way that they were describing exploitation is that often we pay or ask for more than what the real value of something is. So the example that they give is about housing. We know that housing um, keeps going up. And the part of the uh, question that uh, the article was addressing was sometimes it's not just about shortage of housing, but the fact that housing is so unaffordable in spite of there being housing available, right? So that's a very different question. There is housing available. The, the problem is that it's very expensive. So in that case, the expectation is that Something costs beyond the means of a person or a family. Another example about poverty. Yes, Jim. In, in most societies, including our own, there are class structures that pigeonhole people, in a sense, into what they can and cannot do. Right. Um, I was also, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, um, I was reading a little bit about frontline front line workers and essential workers during the pandemic. Many of us became uh, probably aware of many of these uh, groups of people during the pandemic because many of us were not able to go out, but yet there were groups of people that had to be out there to help us and to make sure that society and communities were running. So that's another example of poverty. These are not people that are getting good wages and that they work because they're getting those benefits. They must work to be able to survive. Yes, Marie? What about the third world country? So we're thinking about homelessness, the working poor, and that's in our communities. But our world is bigger than, than, than the states. Yes? What's the to say the poverty of loneliness? Yeah. Right. So that takes us a little bit into the spirituality of poverty. Right? This loneliness uh, that is in, in, inside of us. And that is real, right? Not only because we don't have many physical or social connections, but, but sometimes because there are real uh, limitations to what we can do. Again, uh, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, I was talking to 
Mary, about our aging population, and how there is a desire for many of them to continue uh, feeling part of that community. But they just can't. They, they just can't participate in the activities that we have available for most of the parish community. Um, so, if we see that, right? If we see, yes, sir. When you get to loneliness, then you're talking about the unseen poor. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and again, and many of you who work in the helping professions, and many of you who, who are clinicians, I'm going to Ginny again. Uh, and again, and by the way, Ginny is going to give us a little uh, announcement. Oh, or, or Claudia will give us a little announcement, which touches on that a little bit, right? Uh, this invisible poor among us. Let me go back to the model. So if we have the model, see, judge, and act. So we see the poor, then we judge, right? We have to make uh, an assessment of the situation, right? We talked about housing, okay? So regarding housing, if rent uh, is way too high, one of the things that we can do is try to engage with public officials and try to find a way for public officials to collaborate with many of these um, renters or with the people who own the, uh, the landlords, right? The people who own the units. And so that's when we act, right? We decided to get organized and we make a proposal, either we go to city council or we inform ourselves as to what are the options that we have. So along those lines, question number two, thinking about the importance of encountering the other in our city, how can we respond to the poor in new, more compassionate and inclusive ways? <laughs> so, here's where we really need to get creative. What else can we do? What else can we recommend? What else can we suggest? Already, we know what hasn't worked as good as we thought it could work. What else can we do? In your own life of work, you have some uh, privileged knowledge of what works and what doesn't work. And let me give you an example, again, from caregiving, right? So as a caregiver, I know that I have to be very patient with my client. Because many times, my client is not able to uh, hear me well or move well. So what else can I do with my client? So one of the things that I began doing with my client is exercising in bed. So by exercising in bed, I don't have to push him to get up and try to get around, which would exercise his muscles, but we can still exercise in bed and try to retain some of the flexibility and some of the muscle tone that he needs to have when he definitely needs to get up and move. So for many of us, we have that option. We all come from different backgrounds and we have, we have different knowledge. And so the, the goal is, the goal is for us to think creatively. Okay, so let's pause the few more break and we'll continue with the other things.
right back. Okay. <laughs> The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the additional five. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then, the one who had received two talents also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in the small matters, I will, bring, I will give you great responsibilities. Come share your master's joy. 
Then the one who had received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a demanding person, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter. So out of fear, I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Here it is back. His master said to him in reply, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I'd harvest when I did not plant and gather where I did not scatter? Should you have not then have put the money in my bank so that I would have it back with interest on my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. <clears throat> the gospel of the Lord. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you again. <clears throat> Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Ben. So, for the first part, we talked a lot about poverty and the poor. Now, we are talking about what all of us share in common. So, first is work. Dignity of work and the rights of workers. That's theme number five. Work is more than making a living. In this case, we hear that, that the servants got different amounts of talents, correct? Yes. And so, some of them worked, and one of them did not. Right? We see that there was um, uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> That there was this contrast between two of them and the one. And for the two of them, uh, the master thanked them and welcomed them with him. And the one that didn't work his master's money, uh, what happened to him? He took what did we have. He took whatever he gave. Correct. So, whatever he had, the master asked for it back, and then gave it to someone else. For us, when we think of work, we have to acknowledge the dignity in everybody's contributions. We are not God who can judge other people by what they have and what they fail to do with their talents, right? Um, God has given all of us different talents. And whereas we acknowledge the goodness that some people have in putting those talents to work, we are asked not to judge those of us who fail to put those talents to work. But we do acknowledge that everyone and everybody's contributions are worthy of some value. And so we see that work uh, dignifies the person, right? And so for us to see that work is accomplishing its task, there are four basic rights that we have to observe. So the four basic rights that we have to observe, observe are productive work. Something that is valued, but that is, also, that is also valuable. So what do I mean by that? So, for example, a very clear example, um, homemaker. Right? It's very valuable. It's extremely valuable. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. We have mothers who raised us, and maybe they failed to enter the job market, but they devoted themselves to raising us and raising their families. So it's not physically valuable in many instances, but it has great value for the family. Decent and fair wages, that's another right that we have to fight for. Uh, Chuck earlier said the working poor. 
And in our state, we are fortunate that we are trying to uplift people out of poverty through wages. We have this gradual change towards a living wage in our state, right? For many years, we had the wage just being stagnant, right? Not, not changing, but the prices of the things around us really uh, are increasing, right? Right now in, in our country, we're seeing inflation uh, really have an impact on our purses, on how much money we have available to us. One of the uh, articles, well, going back to the article from the New York Times that I read, uh, was making the case that nowadays many uh, professions or many jobs are now well paid because unions are going away. Unions are uh, disappearing little by little. And sometimes it's not the employee's fault that the unions no longer have such impact on the working conditions or the wages, but it's really the way that uh, employers are not giving their employees an opportunity to organize into a union, or sometimes unions, unions are being uh, misrepresented as not accomplishing the goals of, of the, um, of, of the uh, employees, the workers. Another right is private property. Um, so all of us are fortunate to live in a country where we can purchase and we can accumulate wealth one of the biggest ways for social mobility to happen, where you can become better off, is by the wealth that you can accumulate. For instance, owning a home, being able to have equity on your home, being able to uh, access credit through your work, and being able to establish credit. So not only having credit, but being able to establish credit. So private property allows us an opportunity to move across um, different, we call, we spoke about uh, social classes earlier. Uh, Jim was telling us, well, depending on the wages uh, that you make, you have a lifestyle uh, sort of guaranteed to you. And lastly, another right is economic initiative. And that really talks, that what that really means is having the opportunity to become a small business yourself, an entrepreneur, being able to give it a chance on your own, being able to become your own boss. And in our country, we see that, right? Our communities um, are successful because we have a diversity of small businesses uh, that are able to contribute to our local economies. Uh, I was giving you last week the example about the farmer's market, where we have this small uh, industries being able to provide a service to the community and, be, and us being able to buy those goods from them <coughs> at another location, the, the regular market. Okay, so if theme number five was the economy, theme number seven is care for creation. And I have to acknowledge my friend Monty, who is in the audience with us. Um, uh, the other uh, members of our group, uh, we were able to have uh, a small group of us with some confirmation youth participate in this year's Earth Day cleanup. Um, so this is our, oh, and also, um, uh, I forget my her name. My name. My name. Raise your hand. So that's the first time that I met her. And she's in the picture. My name. <laughs> so it was really, really uh, nice to be able to be with the kids and to uh, realize that there's some kids some youth among us that are genuinely concerned about the environment.
They could have easily done something else on their Saturday morning, but they decided to come join us and, and do something for the common good. So we show our respect for the Creator by our stewardship of creation. Uh, some time ago, about a year ago, I was having a conversation with somebody who was adamantly opposed to uh, care for creation uh, as something that is important to the church. And I, uh, I couldn't really understand uh, why he was so opposed to uh, this awareness that Pope Francis and, and the biblical record uh, asked us to have a creation. Uh, but what I learned from him is that, unfortunately, uh, many people misinterpret the goals of caring for creation. Uh, many people believe, uh, those who, who oppose uh, caring for creation, uh, they believe that we are in it for the political uh, piece of it, that we are against corporations, uh, that we are against um, regulation, or whether we are, that we're in favor of regulation. And really what we are in favor of is collaborating with businesses and individuals to achieve solutions that will help us care for the world. Corporations can easily come to a meeting space to help us develop public policy that preserve not only their uh, bottom line, and that increase their bottom line, which is be profitable, but also that pay a special care to protecting the environment. Um, so care for, for the earth is not just an Earth Day slogan. It's not just something that we do once a year for Earth Day. It's something that is required by, by our faith. We are called to protect people and the planet. Living our faith in relationship with all of God's creation. So, what we see uh, with Pope Francis, Pope Francis calling us to care for creation, did not start with Pope Francis, right? We started these classes going to the biblical record in Genesis. From the very beginning, God entrusted us to care for the world and to have this loving relationship in harmony with our environment. And we also have uh, Pope Benedict XVI, a theologian, who is definitely a committed theologian to understanding and helping us understand uh, God's uh, salvation, uh, saying the following, in our use of and care of the world all around us, we have a responsibility towards the poor, towards future generations, and towards humanity as a whole. Our duties towards the environment are linked to our duties towards the human person. It would be wrong to uphold one set of duties while trampling on the other. What this is saying is that it's out of self-interest as well to care for the world. It's out of self-interest, but it starts with caring for the other. That's where he where the understanding of we have a responsibility towards the poor, towards future generations, and towards humanity as a whole. In another class, we spoke about rights and duties. And I introduced the awareness, the awareness of leadership in a military family, where as leaders, they have a mission to accomplish, right? Uh, leadership in, in military families has a very well-defined mission. Uh, that they have to achieve. But they also have to understand that they have to observe um, authority in their midst. So we have to be reminded of that analogy. When, when we think about caring for the world, we are surrendering our authority to God's authority, to God's uh, role as a creator of everything. So it's not just that we want to do something because we love someone else and we love the world, but it's precisely because we care and love uh, God 
that we're doing um, everything that we can to care for the world. Um, I was, uh, you may remember that, oops. So, this week is a special week for us, uh, as of yesterday. So, May 21st to May the 28th. Laudato uh, Si, the statement called by Pope Francis on caring for our common home, was issued eight years ago. 2015. So, as a reminder of this anniversary, this week, that is starting yesterday, and for the next few days, we are reminded to pay a special attention to what we can do in our personal lives to care for the world. There's a, there's a, there's a specific website, uh, which you can write it down, it's called the Vatican's Laudato Si Action Platform. What we're asking anybody who listens to us is to go to that website and look at the contents of the website. There's many resources that can help you in your own way. However, way, however you decide to do it, try to do something new in caring for the world. Take this week to at the very least visit that website. Check out the resources. And if you feel the calling, there's an opportunity for you to submit a personal plan of action where you can say, I commit over the next year to recycle better. Uh, for instance, to a, a start using more um, uh, energy efficient appliances, to turning off the lights uh, more frequently at my house, to taking shorter showers. And those are simple actions that you can take whenever you feel ready for them. But if you can, and, and if you take the moment to do it, just uh, write down Vatican's Ladato Si Action Platform, and when you get home, just Google it up. Just Google it up, and then explore the site, the website yourself. Okay. So, let's go back to... Let's go back to our uh, parable of the talents. So I'd like you to get a, a little piece of paper. If you have a, a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper. And what I would like you to do is just think about anything that you learned from this class. We have been getting together for the last four Mondays. You have invested a lot of your time, and we thank you for that. Because you have come to uh, four classes on a Monday night. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to write down something that you remember from the class. That's something that you will remember from the class. That's one question. For instance, what will you remember from this class? And it can just be one thing or if you feel called to, you can do two things, or you can do three things. But at the very least, one thing that you'll remember from, from the class. So take a moment and, and answer that, uh, that question. So as you answer that question, the next question that I would like you to answer is, what is it that you didn't understand well from one of these classes? So if you, understand, if you remember something well, what is it that I failed to explain to you properly or adequately? So that gives you a chance to go on your own and do a little bit of research. So identify a need in your own life. If there is something that you learned, what did I fail to learn properly or correctly? So that's question number two. Okay, and lastly, the last question that I would like you to answer is, 
What would you like to learn uh, if this class was offered a second time? So let's say, and let me give you an example. Okay, so I remember the game that we played last week with the chairs, where, where everybody counted to 10. Yeah. That'll be my answer for question number one. What do I remember about the class? The game. Question number two, my answer will be tonight's class. Tonight's class seemed a little bit um, not as complete as the other classes, right? So I would say, generally speaking, uh, probably do a better job uh, going over the last four themes of Catholic social teaching. That'll be something that I could genuinely say. And the last theme that I personally would like to know more about is how does the Franciscan tradition become a, a, an actor, or what role does it play in all of this? I really would like to know more a little bit about that. What do the Franciscans have to say about what we try to do here? Now, in regards to that, I can put Father Sam on the spot, right? And say, well, from what little I know, from what little I know, Father Sam is responding to theme number four. Option for the poor and vulnerable. So I would like to know a little bit more about the history of the work that he's going to be doing when he goes to um, St. Boniface. So I would like to know more about that. Perhaps we could have a guest lecturer from St. Boniface. Somebody who is a member of, of, of that organization, right? Somebody who can help us understand if they're doing something so great up north, what can we be doing in our own a Franciscan community. That's something that I would personally like to know. Help us. You know, give, give us some of your wisdom. What is working in, in your community that we can uh, apply to our own community? That's one thing that I probably, if there's something, help us make that happen in the future. Maybe you can send somebody, <laughs> a, a volunteer, right? Uh, so, the, the goal of, of the three questions is, is to realize that we have achieved something. We have learned the basics of Catholic social teaching. We, we did that. Probably we didn't do that perfectly. Right? And that's okay. That's question number two. Probably we didn't do that the best way we could have done it. But question number three tells us that there's hope. That we can always ask for more. And so that's where we can go back, and if you would like, we can ask Father Oscar and Father Sam and, and, and Deacon Sal eventually to help us and maybe have another class on Catholic social teaching down the line. So that is our hope, that this doesn't end here, but that we can continue and pick up from when we started. So if you don't mind, what I would like us to do as we wait for our guest speaker is to hear directly from you what worked and what didn't work so well. There's always a call to do an evaluation. We, um, some time ago in one of the earlier classes, our friend back there told us that if we're having some issues with our boss, we have to do some self-analysis. What can I do? to do things better. So for us, uh, I will invite you, what worked in these four classes? What did you enjoy from the four classes? And, and I'll need some volunteers. <laughs> yes, Jen. Oh, a couple things. So one of the things I really appreciate about you is your preparation and your delivery. Um, as you, you presented the slides, you were not reading them. You were referencing them questions that we may withdraw another experience that would fit perfectly. And so it, it was a very engaging uh, set of interactions with you. Uh, something else that I appreciate.
educated was learning more about when we talk social justice, most of what we talk about is charity. Um, the part that I don't feel like we covered enough was the social, the, the structural kinds of changes, their possibilities. Um, we touched on it briefly, but that would be the part that I would appreciate a little more. Precisely. Thank you, Jim, because our guest speaker will help us understand a little bit more about the structural causes of how charity becomes uh, social justice. So that is why we invited uh, the guest speaker to come and help us. And if you uh, paid attention, um, I didn't talk about solidarity. Uh, right? So I did not touch about solidarity. But I'll leave this up before uh, she comes in uh, to talk to us. And, and that's where the next step comes up, right? So one thing is to think about our local community, our country, but then also the international community, the human family beyond our borders. And what they do, what CRS does, is that it engages with the political process to bring about relief across the world. And it does that specifically by engaging with public officials around the U.S. Farm Bill. And she can tell us a little more about that. But there are specific provisions of the U.S. Farm Bill where the U.S. Farm Bill can give um, a specific assistance uh, to communities in need. Uh, one example is know-how, that we can share uh, knowledge of um, how to uh, implement technology that many of these places don't have. Let me give you an example. Um, one of the things that CRS does is that they run a program, I forget the, the, the country, but they, they run a program where uh, they set up almost like a store. And so the idea is to support the store because the store benefits the community. So by supporting the store, they're guaranteeing that people in that community will have access to some goods that they may not have access to. So by partnering up with this uh, private enterprise, the benefit is communal. It's not just to make a profit and to keep the business running, but to ensure that the community at large has the bare essentials uh, to be able to, to live or to thrive. So, but Linda will tell us a little bit more about the general uh, uh, drive behind uh, Catholic Relief Services. Anybody else? What worked uh, for these last four classes? Yes? I'd like to share this tables, pictures, graphs, and charts to help Yes. I love uh, tables and charts, <laughs> as we could tell, and I love writing, right? Um, I'm not a native speaker, so sometimes it's a challenge to figure out how to summarize uh, and how to paraphrase, and that's where I rely on graphs <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and other, um, what do you call this, uh, uh, oh, um, images, graphs and images. Uh, so, yes, uh, and um, Father Sam will be able to share the presentations with anybody. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how we'll do that. Uh, he has the information for the last three classes. And hopefully, I believe that Karen uh, Wilson, who is our direct uh, communication uh, director, uh, director of communications in the parish, she'll be able to figure out a way to make those uh, lectures or those presentations accessible to anybody so that you can go back and, and have those, um, you know, as you would like to know more about that. Anyone else? And then we'll, well, let's now, yes, Stacy. I really liked how you did the game of opportunity. It really broke home, even though it didn't necessarily have the
Oh, yeah, I, I love that comment. I, I love this diagram myself. Um, in the Franciscan tradition, can help us understand a lot about fraternity. A lot about fraternity. Because that's one of their values. Fraternity across their community and fraternity across the global community. Um, so yes, um, I myself would like to um, be given a chance, ask for a chance, to talk a little bit more about this diagram in more detail. Not only to tell you about um, the different elements, and let's welcome Ms. Linda Viola from CRS. So that we could really engage in perhaps we could have a chance to get away from the tables right so we so ideally um, if there were the two sections to the class right when one section was the presentation and another was an activity i would like us to move away from the tables for the activity part so you're right then um, we can play around with the configuration and the layout of the room for the future um, and, and thank you about the accolade about the smile. <laughs> I love to present. Um, I, as, as you know, I'm a caregiver. But in my heart of hearts, I want to become a missionary one day, a lay missionary. So it's, it's, anytime I'm given the chance and the opportunity to present to other people, I think of that as a preparation from when Linda sends me abroad to Africa, some other place in the world to teach. So, Ms. Linda Viola, everybody. Thank you, well, thank you for, for the invitation to come and speak to you. Um, I always love coming to Mission San Jose because when I was with the diocese prior to joining CRS, I was in the social ministry office when, in, its old, in its old configuration. And I would always love coming to Mission San Luis Rey because Tony. <laughs> Tony and then and the Franciscans and then Angie Muro, who I was so happy to see in this in the Spanish, because these were one of my first leaders when I was working in the social justice office in, uh, at the diocese. But six years ago, as I said, I jumped over to Catholic Relief Services, and I am now the manager of the National Hispanic Engagement and Support Team. What does that mean? Well, that means that I go out and visit the Hispanic community and talk to them about CRS. And then I go to CRS and I teach them about the Hispanic community. So, um, how many of you are, and many of you heard of CRS, of Catholic Relief Services? Oh, good, this is great, so this is going to be easy. <laughs> so, prior to that, I know you have been reflecting on this particular passage of the Gospel, Matthew 25. I like to call it our final exam, right? Do you know the questions to the final exam that we will all have as nations and as individuals when we go before Jesus sitting on the throne? Oh yeah, remember? I was hungry and I was naked and you me. I was in prison and you visited me. So let's think a little bit as we've been thinking over these last four sessions or however many sessions you've had, who are the least among us? Who are those brothers and sisters of Jesus in our communities today? And we start with our basic community, our community, our family community, and then we go expand to our church community, and then our city and our nation, 
like all the way up to our nation. And then we take it one step further, globally. Who are those that are in need today? And that's what Catholic Relief Services is about, especially you've talked about today, the preferential option for the poor. And what does that mean? Well, we have this from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it tells us that the Church's love for the poor is part of her constant tradition. It's from the beginning. From the minute that Adam and Eve said, no, thank you, and they got asked to leave, there's always been that need. Well, that, that need and that love for others and that work that we have to love others. And so the Catechism tells us, this love is inspired by the gospel of the Beatitudes. And I know you all know the Beatitudes, so we don't have a quiz. I don't know if Tony told you I was giving the final exam today. <laughs> <laughs> but the Beatitudes, if you need to look them up, Matthew chapter 5, or you can find them in Luke. Um, um, the love is inspired by the poverty of Jesus. God becoming flesh, taking that poor, humble form of a baby. Those of you who are blessed to be mothers, your child played soccer while he, was, he or she was in your womb. He did that with Mary. He did that with her mama Mary, too. So you have that connection, so that, that simpleness, that one, that, that tiny, vulnerable form, because they weren't by, if I remember correctly, they weren't a rich family, right? So he understood, and he went, he could have gone to the palace of Herod, and that's what Herod wanted him, but no. He goes to this cave, this stable, in the tiniest of towns to be born, and to be raised in a place where one of the apostles, one of the disciples tells us, right? Does anything good come from Nazareth? Yes. Well, we know the end of the story, right? So, the catechism reminds us that the church continues and has not ended her work with liberating the poor and coming to their defense and their duty to their relief. So who is CRS? Well, CRS is the International Humanitarian Agency of the, uh, and, and Integral Human Development of the U.S. Catholic bishops, but of the Catholic community. What we do, we do in your name. When you uh, give a donation to CRS, or you participate in Rice Bowl and you put your, um, your, your Lenten donations there, that money is used on your behalf to help the poor and the needy and the, and the vulnerable in the world. And we do it in, um, it was established in 1943 and its name was known as War Relief Services. So we're celebrating 80 years as an agency this year. The first refugees were refugees from Poland in World War II. Here comes the next question on the test. <laughs> what country were those Polish refugees settled in? In the United States. Who says the United States? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not the United States. In Canada? No. In Mexico. In Mexico. They are in Baja. In, in, Sonora, Puebla. in Puebla. In Puebla. So the first refugees that Catholic Relief Services helped were repatriated, repatriated in Mexico. That's why there's a lot of Polish people in Mexico. <laughs> and we serve in over 100 countries in the world. <laughs> so what is our mission? Well, we provide, like I said, we provide assistance in case of an emergency. There's an earthquake. There's a hurricane, there's a typhoon, there's a war in Ukraine, any civil unrest. And pretty often Catholic Relief Services is one of the first agencies that's there to assist. Why? Because we're in over 100 countries. But if you think of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, what are those again? Can you name them? <laughs> Tell me you don't bring her back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Give food to the needy, clothe the naked, and Okay, so if you, that all those corporate works of mercy, those are what happens when we have an emergency assistance. Because we want to bring, we want to heal their wounds, we want to feed them, their suffering. 
So that's what emergency assistance is. But human development or integral human development or community development happens after the emergency has tended to. So we have programs that deal with agriculture. We're helping farmers find better crops, improve their crops, the turnout of their crops. Um, education, especially for girls. In Afghanistan, that was one of the biggest programs we had is education for, for girls. Um, maternal and child health care. Okay? It's one of the most dangerous things for women to do is to give birth. Now imagine in Africa, okay, where there's not enough uh, supplies or there's malnourishment. And those are the programs that you help fund and that we do the work in these countries. We also do microfinances or um, these small communities. Got the name right now. Uh, we, we go to communities and we teach the women how to do their, their own banking and they give each other loans and, and so they, they come up with their own rules, kind of like a like a credit union, but in a small microcosm. But we also of course have many water projects. The other thing that we do do also when there's conflict, we work for peace and reconciliation. So in Gaza, we have programs there for youth to talk about peace and reconciliation between the Jewish settlers and the, um, the, the Palestinians. Okay? And these are ways that we advance. Um, in Africa, many of the tribal nations, there's also these disputes. And so we have programs that are funded by the US government, but also by your donations that help bring this about. In the United States, and I'll come back to this, but we are working with Catholics with their faith into action, okay? And into solidarity, to be, to respond and to be there with their brothers and sisters. And we do that by promoting justice and advocating for just policy. So where do we work? As I mentioned, we work in over 100 countries, all but in blue. How does CRS decide what country to go to? Well, it's dependent on the bishops of that nation. So if there's a country that's not there, it's, that's not blue, it's because either there's no need, there are much more developed countries, or the bishops have not yet asked us to come to that particular nation. So in over 110 countries, over 130 million people that we assist. Um, I, I know you saw this, but it's in Spanish, but you saw it in English. You remember what that is, right? Two feet in action. Two ways that we walk in love. And this is what we're doing. We're putting our love into action. I believe you also saw a slide today, no, where the longest distance in the world is between your head and your heart. Well, this is what helps us move. The social, the, the social justice aspect is what we're looking at, and there's the charity, you know, that emergency assistance, what we give, the need, that fills the needs there. But the social justice part is the hard part. It's that judging in the See Judge Act and transformation that helps us to get there. So why is that important for us at CRS? Well, that leads to the work that we're doing here in the United States. There's two big, two ways that we're doing it. The first one is through our campaigns. Um, if you subscribed to a text camp, or you, you sent a text at one point to uh, support something for CRS, every now and then you'll get a text message asking you to act on one of our campaigns. And our current campaigns are on hunger and climate change. And we're really gonna be, if we're working on, right now, the reauthorization of the farm bill. And you're like, why are you getting into that? <laughs> well, because part of the Farm Bill funds a lot of our international assistance programs. It funds a lot of the programs that help eradicate hunger overseas. So it's not just because it, it helps our farmers here, but it has an international aspect tied to it. And the other one is climate change. And not so much um, it, it, climate change as a whole, and we're not gonna, you know, I know that's, that's a tricky uh, subject sometimes, especially when we bring it up, but think about, um, think about who's next door right now. I asked the question, 
I said, of all of you here, including me, who was born in the United States? Okay. Over there, I was the only one with my hand up. Really? I was the only one with my hand up. When I was over there, I was the only person that was born in the United States. Why did they come? Can we talk a little bit about that? It could have been because of violence. It could have been because of the, you know, the economics. It could have been because of climate change, because of natural disasters, because they can no longer sustain their, pop, their crops. So a lot of the work that we're doing in climate change is also dealing with vibration issues, why people have to leave, why they have to be displaced. So we had an interesting experience because we understand displacement. We are all displaced because they're not in our home country. I'd like to introduce to you Eulalia. Eulalia lives in Honduras. He is a farmer. He lives in that section that's known as the Dry Corridor, that for years has had drought. And he's a farmer, and um, he has five children. And he can't sustain his family. And so he um, was trying to figure out a way how he was going to make a living. And one of the decisions always is, well, maybe I need to leave. Maybe I need to leave the United States or somewhere else where I can sustain my family. But he heard of a program that we have in Honduras that talks uh, about agriculture, how to diversify your crops, how to choose better crops, how to use water smart technology. And so Elalio went and took part of that program. And he learned about irrigation, drop, what do you call it, one drop? Drip irrigation. Have a Spanish and English going on in here. So, it's like, you know, so he learned about this irrigation and he bettered his crops and he diversified his crops and now he has an abundance of crops. And he says that thanks to that, he doesn't have to leave, he can stay with his family. So that's the work that we're, that's some of the work that we're doing overseas in Honduras, but through the campaigns, through the work that, getting the word out, and trying to get legislation passed like the farm bill. So, if you want to get done, I give you permission to take your, 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 your phones out. If you would like to find out more information about our campaigns, you can take a picture of that QR code and it sends you to the website, or you can visit us at crs.org. And, and I'm kind of speeding up because I know time-wise. And all, all these slides will be available to you later as well. I'll make sure Tony has them. The other thing that we do, um, how we work with the United, uh, here, the community in the United States, is through our CRS chapters. Um, one of the most frustrating things that we have when we try to be, put our faith into action on anything, not just in CRS, is that it's only sometimes a couple of people, or it's a small group, and there's, uh, there's, there's no way to have some impact, right? So CRS was um, reflecting on this a few years ago, and they said, we have to start working on legislation, but we have to do it in a way where we can have impact, where we can not only um, educate people, but we can educate our members of Congress, our elected representatives, to make a difference. And so we came up with CRS chapters. And what are the CRS, what do they do? They are communities of faith and action. These are the groups of people that come together to fellowship and to organize advocacy and giving opportunities to help support and build a better world, a more just world. A lot of the work that we do is advocacy. We go and build relationships with our um, legislative and elected representatives. We have a chapter here in, in the Diocese of San Diego, and they have already organized visits with Sarah Jacobs and with Mike Levin to bring up issues that are important for work on CRS. One of them was the Global Child Thrive Act. You may have heard of that. 
The Global Child Thrive Act was a bipartisan bill that we were able to pass in less than two years. And those of you who are little policy wonks like I am will know that two years is amazing because it takes years and years to get something passed in Congress. And why was it, <laughs> why was it that it passed? Well, because we organized ourselves into these chapters and it was legislation that made sense because in our international aid, there was no funding for children for the first five years of life. No early education for children. So we went to Congress and said, doesn't this make sense? Don't we want to give children a head start? And they agreed. And so both parties came together and we were able to pass the Global Child Thrive Act because we took the time to educate ourselves and to go to Congress. And then we, said, we decided that we were going to do this and COVID started. So what did we do? We pivoted. We get together. All our, a lot of our chapters are still meeting by Zoom. Very few are starting to meet in person. But they meet by Zoom. They do their legislative visits by, by Zoom. In fact, we, we're gearing up for August recess because a lot of our Congress people are back in their home uh, districts and we're trying to organize people to do visits with them. But this is a lot of what the, the communities do, the chapters do. The other thing is they promote community giving events. And I know I, I, I come to understand that your parish is very familiar with these little boxes with CRS Rice Bowl. And that's one of the activities that the communities also get involved in and, and do. Is they help raise funds to help us do the work that we do. So this is a snapshot of our chapters. Um, right now, is that we have active chapters, we have the most active, even though you see a bunch over here in California, they're actually the most active chapters that we have are the ones in California, and uh, the ones in, in Washington. But all these groups, groups of people, five to ten people in each community or chapter that come together and they learn about the issues that CRS promotes, they learn about the programs, and they help promote uh, legislation that's more just around hunger, around migration, around climate, that help our brothers and sisters in the world. And here's a, a couple of pictures of our San Diego chapter in action. You might recognize some faces in it. And so this is what they do. They also go to diocesan events and they table and they talk about CRS and they try to get people involved in the community. <coughs> If you would like to join the chapter or learn a little bit more about the chapter, you can visit the diocesan webpage. Right now, that's only in Spanish, but if there's interest in ever doing one in English or making it bilingual, we're always open to that. And if you would like more information about the chapters, there again is the, uh, the, the QR code. Or you can text CRS chapters to 6. Seven seven six eight. Um, I don't know that we have any time for questions, but if you would ever want to ask a question or would like to learn a little bit more about CRS, there's my contact information. I have some business cards here too that um, if anyone would like to take them. They're available, or if anyone has any quick questions, because I know I'm getting the time for right here. <laughs> yes, you would. Um, there are other fraternal organizations like Kiwanis, Rotary, and some of these that do some of these international projects. Do you ever team up with them? Yes, we do work with other um, organizations, um, but since we are Catholic Relief Services, it has to be done a certain project, and we have to respect our Catholic values. But our guiding principles are the ones that you have been studying these past few years, these Catholic social teaching. But since we work with Catholics and non-Catholics, we call them our guiding principles. But yes, we do often pair up with some of some other organizations. Good. Now 
you have any more questions for Linda, um, is it okay for them to email yeah, address? Yes, of course, I also have my business cards. And there's some business cards here if you would like to find out more about how you can be personally involved. And uh, we're going to go back to our closing, to our opening prayer. Is that going to be our closing prayer? So let me find it. Uh, but this time, we're just going to do the solidarity uh, part. Okay? So we are going to I'll do global solidarity. So look out for your handout and look for the global solidarity section. You got it? So in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a reading from the prophet Micah. He shall judge between many peoples and search terms for strong and distant nations. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not rise the sword against another nor shall they train for war again. We are our brothers and sisters in Jesus. We are one human family. Whatever our national, racial, ethnic, economic, and ideological differences, learning to practice the virtue of solidarity means learning by loving our neighbor as global definitions in an interdependent world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we leave, I'll like to invite Claudia to just give us a little announcement about the uh, new opportunity for uh, caregivers, and we're done.